I am very happy to open this meeting uh, to a very important subject. And uh, of course, uh, the chairman of the session is uh, President Tamani. And uh, I want only to say that uh, uh, I present my, my paper. Uh, you can read this uh, long paper. Uh, but uh, this is also to prepare the second, the second turn that we have about the same subject. But the question for me uh, is very important because in the end, if we want to realize the idea of the Pope of the fraternity, uh, it is absolutely necessary that this fraternity uh, go uh, in, the first, in the first turn, in the first instrument, uh, to the to the matrimony because uh, that is Joseph uh, because uh, uh, the, 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 the church considering that the the, the the sacrament of the marriage is uh, the cell of the society and uh, and if you consider real the things this is the unique sacrament that is completely, we can say, a secular sacrament because the other sacraments are in uh, direct relation with the, with the kingdom of, of heaven. But this, yes, as relation of the kingdom of heaven, but in the measure that we realize the ends that have in the society, that is uh, the, the, the friendship of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the members, and education, and also the procreation. So this is really the sacrament of the social order. And uh, it's very interesting that the, the new catechism approved and, uh, by the, the Pope John Paul II, but organized by the Pope Benedict, uh, follow uh, in the end the structure of the sacrament proposed by Thomas Aquinas that was the first to really uh, put an order in the sacraments of the point of view theological. And he say, there are sacraments that are for the individual, for the persons, for born in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the new life of, of, the, of the grace of Christ, for be confirmed in this, for uh, prepare the, the last moment of the, of the life. And, but there are other sacraments, and there's two, that are for the social order. And these are the sacrament of the order and the sacrament of the marriage. And of course, the sacrament of the order today conserve a stru structure uh, for the hierarchy of the church, a uh, little clerical. But you know, in the past, also was some form of layman application in the, in the kings, in the unction of the kings, uh, for example, the Visigothic king. But I don't want to speak about this. Uh, I, in the contrary, we conserve for the social order, the sacrament <coughs> of the marriage. And you, you know, the ministers of the sacrament are the, 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 the conjugate, the, 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 the people, the two persons to, to realize the, the, the sacrament, that are one minute for the other. And in some sense, the grace of Christ go from the one minister to another minister. And the new consideration to put in the, in, in the synod of, uh, of the family um, organized by Pope Francis, is very interesting because say explicitly that the grace of the sacrament of marriage need to, 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 to do a, some kind of, uh, of web, a webbing to extend of the, the, all this grace to all the society because the society as society need uh, to be uh, purified by the grace of Christ and to be elevated by the grace of Christ to, to can realize really the friendship that is indicated 
as the essence of the social order. So if we can have fraternity, if we can have fraternity founded in this social friendship that say the Pope, we need the extension of the grace of the matrimony to all the society. So I think this is the sacrament of our times. And uh, for this, I think in a theological consideration that our meeting is very important. And uh, we think that the project to have a new compact of the, of the idea to come back, to have a new, uh, in, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate to the people the importance of this could be very, very important for all the society and if the things that we more need in these days. I don't want to say more, but of course, I am open to all the questions if they have in the moment of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Monsieur Sorondo. Now we are ready to listen to Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Is he connected? Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, Joe. How are you? Fine. Fine. I'm fine. Fine. Look, before I start, this morning, a few hours ago here, the Guzman was here. And he said to us, please remember me to my teacher and my, uh, let's say, <laughs> great figure. So that is uh, what I want. He came here to discuss the problem about which you can imagine. And so, there is. so we are very pleased now to yeah. offer now uh, the floor to Professor Joseph Stiglitz. And we thank him. As I already anticipated, he will be excused because uh, little after his presentation, he has to leave for another uh, incumbent duty. So thank you very much. The floor is yours, Joe. Well, thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to speak about what may be viewed as the uh, Chicago School uh, view of the family. Uh, in some ways, it is a particularly distasteful topic, uh, and I'll explain why. And so before coming to it, I want to put the issue in some broader perspective. Um, I, I want to begin by echoing the overview circulated before this webinar that began with a quotation from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and uh, that began, began uh, uh, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. Well, this is a moment in which uh, we are reassessing all the constituent elements of our society, including the role of the state versus the market, the role of corporations and so forth. A central element of the standard economics approach, including that of uh, Chicago, and Chicago is symbolic of a, of a, a, a very market oriented view of uh, society, so it's not, there are many people in Chicago who are not that way, but it's become emblematic of the, a particular uh, perspective. Um, a central element of the standard economics approach is to see all collectives, all organizations as basically instrumental and in some sense, largely unnecessary. Individuals exist in isolation, engage in contracts with others to maximize their own private utility. Ronald Coase, who was a recipient of the Nobel Prize, uh, argued that firms, for instance, are, exist to save on transactions cost. They serve no other function in our society. Uh, it's just a web of contracts. And it turns out that firms uh, are a way of organizing uh, society, part of society, to save on contracting costs. Uh, he didn't address himself to the question of why the family exists, uh, or in any way to the family, but his colleague, Gary Becker, who also received uh, a Nobel Prize, uh, did so in his book, 
a treatise on the family. And uh, the blurb for the work, book summarizes uh, the Chicago school, I think, very well. Uh, it said, imagine each family as a kind of little factory, a multi-person unit producing meals, health, skills, children, and self-esteem for market goods and the time, skills, and knowledge of its members. This is only one of the remarkable concepts explored by Gary Becker in his landmark work on the family. Of course, my response is, it is indeed remarkable in its narrowness, its lack of humanity, its lack of understanding of what we mean by human well-being or of a good society. Um, and that, I think, is uh, characteristic of a lot of the Chicago school. They, they simply uh, miss the forest as they focus on the individual trees. The book champions uh, a set of policy prescriptions derived from this vision. I would castigate uh, this Chicago view, the Beckerian view, for exactly uh, the same reason. The objective of policy should be to think about what we mean by human well being, what we mean by a good society how families fit into that, and how policies then fit into that broader conception. As a large literature, uh, including that of the Harvard philosopher uh, Michael Sandel has pointed out, a transactional uh, perspective on human relations and human activity can be destructive of meaning, destructive of what give a, gives us pleasure and contribute, contributes to individual and societal well-being. This is especially so when it comes to the many dimensions of well-being that are not directly related to material goods. If I believe you are treating me well simply as a matter of exchange so that I will treat you well, it can destroy the heart of the relationship. And yet that kind of quid pro quo is at the uh, center of the Chicago view of the family. There are many other uh, problems with uh, the Chicago perspective and uh, I, I, I'll highlight them, but I do think uh, it's interesting to begin uh, the discussion of this meeting uh, uh, with the Chicago view because it highlights the antithesis of what uh, we should be uh, trying to talk about uh, in this meeting. Um, for instance, one of the things that uh, I find uh, 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 very uh, unattractive, uh, and yet it's one of the things that uh, Gary Becker and work with the George Stigler uh, actually champion, uh, is that it begins with what economists call exogenous preferences, preferences individuals begin life as if they're fully formed with beliefs about what they want, uh, what are good, uh, uh, what gives them utility. One of the main aspects of the family is the interactive shaping and evolution of preferences and beliefs uh, about what is meaningful, what about what is important. Most obviously and importantly, uh, in our roles of parents as we help shape our children, but equally important in the other relationships within the family. So this assumption of exogenous as opposed to endogenous preferences uh, is actually, I think, uh, one of the critical failings of the Chicago School. Ironically, uh, family decision-making ignored uh, the critical insights into collective decision-making made by one of the uh, earlier, uh, one of the members of, of uh, this academy, uh, Ken Arrow. Uh, one of uh, Ken Arrow's most important uh, insights, his PhD thesis uh, published in 1951 was called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. It's about the difficulties of any collectivity with different preferences uh, arriving at a 
uh, uh, collective decision in, uh, and a set of decisions that uh, are, reflect the kind of consistency uh, that we think about as uh, uh, essential uh, when we uh, talk about uh, well-formulated preferences. It is in fact most likely that through the endogenous formation of preferences and our trying to accommodate each other that the arrow pop paradox is actually avoided. There is another perspective that has grown uh, in popularity uh, in uh, the analysis of the family that I think it has some validity. And that is even more hostile to the holistic view of the family that I think probably most of us uh, would share. And uh, that view emphasizes the bargaining uh, that goes on within the family, it sees the family as uh, a collectivity of individuals that bargain with each other um, and uh, focuses on uh, the distribution of power within the family. Unfortunately, the evidence is actually quite strong that there is more than a grain of truth in that model of how the family operates, or at least uh, more than a grain of truth in how the family has operated in many countries uh, and uh, in the past. Just as we have now begun to rethink the corporation and the market as units within our society and how we can reconceptualize them in ways that advance societal and individual being, so too, I think we now have to begin to reconceptualize the family, but in a way uh, markedly different from that suggested by the Chicago School. In particular, this reconceptualization uh, has to think about how we can create what might in uh, other contexts be to, uh, referred to as a, a more inclusive uh, family where uh, there is greater respect uh, for all the members of the family, greater dignity, greater scope for them to um, uh, reach uh, their own self-fulfillment, but in ways that are uh, consistent with uh, the well-being of this basic unit of our society that I began our discussion with the family. And uh, through that, increasing uh, the overall well-being of society. So thank you very much for, for uh, giving me this chance to, to share some of my views, uh, hopefully going uh, beyond uh, the Chicago school. Can you spare another 10 minutes with us? Are you willing to answer some question? Yeah. Okay. Now, let us have a, a short discussion on uh, what Please, the floor is yours. Who wants to? Otherwise, I will face after you. Vittorio, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Joseph, for a splendid presentation. Uh, you addressed one of the big issues uh, of the interchange between ethics and economics. Where do our preferences come from? And you rightly said that uh, Eros, uh, a famous theorem, uh, presupposes, of course, an individualistic approach, and that a large part of societal work as it begins in the family and continues in institutions dedicated to the formation of values like religious education and so on, try to form common values that allow us then to find a unity that goes beyond bargaining. But my question to you is, where do these common values come from? Ultimately, with regard to this issue, you have also two philosophical possibilities. 
you can save it. Ultimately, it's a question of power. Some people are simply more powerful or some institution to push through their values. Others would say that there is an innate capacity of human reason um, to understand certain objective values and that institutions do not impose values but help our mind to recognize these values. What is your position with regard to our cognition of values? I think there are elements uh, of both. Uh, clearly, uh, as academics, uh, what we uh, try to do is uh, articulate our values in ways that make them persuasive to others as their cognition uh, recognizes. So we recognize there's reason, but there's also emotion and we, we try to appeal at many different levels. Uh, we appeal to their reason, but we also want to uh, persuade them. And that means uh, going beyond simple uh, reason to, to, to uh, highlight other, other aspects. Now, uh, and that's, you might say, the power of ideas. And that's our particular power. Uh, to the extent that we have any power, it is through the exercise of the power of ideas. But it is also the case that uh, there is a broader sense of power, uh, which ideas get to the top of the table, get disseminated, uh, get uh, respect. And that's a different sense of power uh, it's very clear that those who control the media have the power to disseminate, disseminate certain ideas. Uh, it's very clear that to, to give a bad example, uh, the President uh, Trump in the United States used the power to uh, disseminate values that are the antithesis of what I would say are the right values. But he used that power of the, it was sometimes called the power of the pulpit, but in the very opposite side of what we would call the pulpit, uh, 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 the bully pulpit, it is often uh, to uh, propagate ideas. So what I would say is uh, obviously um, that we see the limits of reason in the sense in which many of these uh, bad ideas have found acceptance in significant proportions of our population. So um, what, what we, you might say as academicians, are engaged in using the one power that we have, which is the power of ideas, and to combat other sources of power and I view that as an ongoing battle uh, that uh, we, we are uh, is in the center uh, and what we are, uh, of what we are engaged in right now and we see it so, so forcefully. Thank you, Joe. I have a question, which is a more better to say a remark. You correctly mentioned the assumption of exogenous preferences. And that is a bit ironic for mainstream economics, because if there is a place in institutions where uh, preferences cannot be exogenous, is the family. Because you can assume that the parents have exogenous, but what about the children? How can you assume that the child <laughs> has exogenous? And I, what is your explanation of the fact that, that these uh, colleagues who are outstanding, they never consider this aspect because the very moment uh, you introduce the endogenous changes of preference, all that theory collapses. What is your explanation of that? I, I can't agree more with you. I mean, yeah, as, as parents, uh, that's what we do almost full time. Uh, we want to impart senses of responsibility, truth, uh, concern for others. Uh, you know, that, this is, I would view that that's our job as, 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 as parents. So uh, I find it uh, astounding 
that they put on blinkers that are so strong. And what that is testimony to is the nature of almost any academic discipline. Uh, an academic discipline is discipline. It, it, it's about putting blinders on so that you solve a problem, you make a set of assumptions, you're trained to think within a particular narrow uh, perspective. But uh, good acad academicians, good are always challenging the boundaries of that discipline and saying, well, for some problems, that's a good assumption, but not when we come to the issue, say, of, of the family. Uh, and I've been spending, and a lot of other people have as well, a lot of time in the last uh, decade precisely on this broader issue of the endogenous formation of preferences, because it is so strong, so clear that um, uh, that's at the core of much of what was going on in the evolution uh, of our society. And uh, uh, we are working very hard, just to give you one example, as we face the issue of climate change, the, no. we've had some very good discussions here Thank you. about the climate change. We have time for one more question. Is uh, Marcelo, you want to raise a question? Marcelo Orozco. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful uh, reflection. And my question really flows from an empirical concern. And that is uh, in the, especially in the Anglo-American tradition, the reign and the supremacy of privileging the individual as a fundamental unit of analysis it really is a fundamental point of departure in much of psychology, in much of human development, uh, cognitive science, uh, and, uh, and the like. Uh, an entire field of inquiry, uh, initially in the British school, uh, subsequently um, France, and uh, eventually also uh, in, uh, in our country, the United States, uh, was built around the study of kinship, social organization, and the family. Um, the entirety of the British empirical um, effort in understanding uh, social organization flowed from uh, a very uh, early empirical encounter with forms of the family that did not align, that often contravene what were seen as the units, uh, fund the fundamental uh, units that build society in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, European and Anglo-European uh, world, where the idea of the family flows from a set of relational engagements, not from the concept of a unit that is single standing, autonomous, and independent of other such unit. Thank you. Uh, the study of the family is the study of social organization, exchange theory, Thank alliance you. theory, uh, marriage theory flows from a completely different view of the human family than say the Chicago school. Thank you. Now the floor is yours, and Joe, and then, okay. please. Let me just, uh, I, I think uh, uh, you're right, and uh, this is sometimes, uh, uh, this focus on individualism is one of the uh, major di divisions in, uh, you might say, uh, uh, social sciences. Uh, I began my remarks by saying that uh, the, the uh, Chicago view is really where social relations are only instrumental and the only unit in society is uh, the individual. Um, one of the reasons I am in my remarks, the, our preferences are to a large extent shaped by our society. Of the family being the most important unit that I mentioned, 
But there are many other aspects of the ways in which our society shapes our preferences. And there is there a, you might call it a simultaneity. The individual shapes society and society shapes the individual. And uh, that interaction, I think, is really at the core of our trying to understand uh, how societies uh, behave. Uh, and, and as we try to contemplate what makes for a good society and uh, a society that, that uh, enhances individual and, and, and overall well-being, uh, we have to uh, look very carefully at this two-way relationship about how individuals shape society and society shape individuals, including through the subunits like the family and the corporation, uh, which are important uh, organizational forms uh, within our society. So I think what I've been trying to argue here is the, the, that, that we have to break out of that contractual individualistic perspective on the family and other organizations within society and try to move towards a more holistic uh, framework uh, for understanding uh, uh, society and, and what makes for well-being uh, a, a well-functioning society. Thank you very much, Joe. We are looking forward to meeting you here in presence. Eh? We will meet in October on the big uh, conference on inequalities. And so have a nice uh, time. And let me move now to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Monsignor Roland Minera. Reflections on the Catholic social teaching regarding the family. Thank you, Joe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, our topic is most challenging today, especially if dealt with by the Catholic Church. On the one side, the Church is criticized for her doctrine on marriage and family. On the other hand, she arouses incomprehension in explaining that her teaching is universal and grounded on the very nature of human beings. Every person has an experience, good or bad, of what is a family. Today, it becomes impossible to give a unique definition of the family. The aim of our meeting is to clarify our I... approach. My approach cannot be only descriptive. It entails a normative aspect. But which one? The doctrine of the church relies on the biblical data and its interpretation along the centuries. Until the middle of the last century, there was no doubt that the family is based on marriage of a man and a woman who beget and educate children. We are witnessing now an, an anthropological revolution which tries to legitimate the constructivist approach to human beings living in society. This encompasses Current trends dissociate sexuality from personal identity, as if <clears throat> the identity of a person could be separated from her or his bodily existence. According to such views, one is free to construct one's own personality, including one's sexual identity, rather than accepting it as a given. Recent gender ideology claims that once gender is so independent from personal sexual identity that it is purely a social or cultural construct. More recently, cert certain currents of thought have been demanding the extension of the institution of marriage to homosexual unions under the pretext of equality. Thus, society is implicated in a confusion about the very notion of marriage. People who discover that they are, have a homosexual leaning must be protected 
from the old social discrimination. But there is no discrimination when the law refuses to confuse states or conditions which are in themselves diverse. A homosexual couple is not discriminated against if it is excluded from the institution of marriage, which by definition is a union between a man and a woman. Resorting to technological means in the process of fertilization turns void the necessary relationship of love of a man and a woman in generating a new life. Assisted reproduction, extramarital couples, surrogate pregnancy, and now the perspective of artificial uterus open the way to a total redefinition of human sexuality, married life, and family. Families exist in various structures. <clears throat> Traditional families existed under three config configurations. The extended family, when two or more generations were living under the same roof. In traditional societies, especially in Africa, the intergenerational family has survived, grouping around the pater familias, sons and their wives, daughters and their husbands, and the children involved. These family communities are social cells bonded by solidarity maintained by strong feelings of belonging and a traditional code of values. These kinds of families offer better resistance to ideological or political power. Another traditional family is obviously the root family with one couple per generation and the nuclear family, parents and non-married children, which is the general rule in the West. Now, new family, forms of families have uh, appeared since 1960, more or less. Step families, after a remarriage with children from a former marriage, uh, I think in France we have 45% of married couples who have divorced and get remarried. Then we have single parent families with only one parent and children. Uh, in the West, uh, disaffection with marriage and the increase of uh, civil divorce, we see a growing number of single parent families. The emotional balance of a child is ine inevit inevitably affected by the separation of the parents. Individual centered societies and progressively are progressively losing sight of the formative importance of the family, the functions of protection, education, and, and upbringing previously carried out by the family have largely been taken over by society. <clears throat> then we have families which exist out without the bond of marriage, cohabitation with children out of marriage with a legal recognition in the form of PACs and funds and other forms in other countries, give some fiscal advantage to non-married couples. And uh, on the other hand, more and more people are living alone. So a definition uh, of family is nearly impossible. A couple, married or not, is not a family, it becomes a family when the first child appears. The family is bound, built around two types of connections. That which exists between parents and child, which is absolute, and the marital relationship, which can be broken. If the marriage bond becomes unstable, the parent-child connection is bound to suffer as well. The grand totalitarian utopias all began with the dismantling of the family in order to more effectively dominate each member of society. 
liberal societies which give legal recognition to de facto and homosexual unions are oriented toward a definition of the family that depends on parent-child relationship and not on marriage. Social and tax laws are gradually normalizing different models of family that are deemed to be equivalent. Lawmakers further contribute to this tendency by recognizing, given the number of births outside marriage, the same rights to legitimate children. Second point, and this is my point, is there a project of God with respect to the family? Before and after the two synods on the family, a big amount of biblical, theological, and pastoral publications have been issued, generally very distant from the current Catholic doctrine on marriage and family. These studies are revisiting the biblical data and draw sometimes unexpected, not always convincing, conclusions. One point is not disputable. In both narratives of the Genesis, the creation of the human being as male and female is immediately referred to the order to be fruitful and to multiply and to build up one flesh. So re-establishing the human fullness of Adam. The Hebrew use, uses the word Adam for human being in Greek, anthropos, in German, mensch, while it uses the other distinct words for male and female. At the beginning is created the human being, made male and female at God's resembling image. The image of God is in the union of man and woman. The human being, man and woman, reflect the glory of the creator when they participate in his creative project. So families have a place in the project of God on creation. Men and women are made for one another. The root of the family is a union of a man and a woman able to transmit life. The generation of a child creates a family. This is a given, not a construct which stays behind the legal link of marriage, which is elaborated by society. The narrative of Genesis <coughs> is a call to all humanity, which can be received in all cultures. The fullness of the human being is a couple of man and woman. Genesis 2.24 says that to start a family, we need to leave our own family. So parents should prepare children to leave domestic security. Children are not their belongings. Leave father and mother. The word used is dabak, which means to stick to his wife. The same word is used for the covenant between God and his people. The union of a man and a woman re-establishes the unity of Adam. Together they are image of God, and the image of God whose essence is love, love that gives li life. The essence of love is the Holy Trinity. Saint Augustine said, the lover, the loved one, and love itself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible put, puts very high the value of the family. Even though the word family does not appear in Hebrew, instead the Bible speaks of house, the house of David and so on, or clan. The Bible does not offer a convincing model of family. It goes to the nucleus that produces matrimonial links in order to set up new lives. No doubt, families in the Old Testament were patriarchal. In an integrated hierarchy, families, clans, tribes, city, patriarchies meant that the head of the family 
could have various spouses and concubines, he decided over the future of his children, marriages were arranged and divorce tolerated only on the initiative of men. Many family stories in the Old Testament are far from an ideal conception of the family. The first offspring of Adam and Eva, Cain, murdered his brother Ab Abel through hatred and jealousy. In the classical world, the pater familias ruled the family as long as he was living, deciding on his children's marriages and activities. He would decide about conserving or destroying a child born. Families had their own tear gods maintaining the link with their ancestors. In Roman law, marriage was a contract which could be undone by divorce. In the Jewish and Christian tradition, and even Islamic, the core of marriage and family is man and woman, united as procreators at the image of the creator himself. This excludes definitely from the understanding of marriage, same-sex unions, fertilization through a third giver, gestational surrogacy. Now, what did Jesus bring uh, as new in this context? The New Testament is understood as a fulfillment of the old one. The Old Testament tolerated polygamy and divorce with remarriage. Even so, the paradigm of marriage was given in the union of a single man and a single woman, the basis of equality in their mutual commitment. Jesus has dealt with the question of repudiation and divorce in the Sermon on the Mount. It is important to stress that Jesus came not to abolish but to fulfill the law of Moses. Jesus, in a way, radicalizes the law, going beyond its prescriptive aspect and internalizing its demands according to its spirit. So he stated that adultery is attempted even by desire and intention. Jesus even called a new marriage after divorce an adultery. He dismissed divorce, saying that from the beginning it was not so. Indeed, I quote, have you not read that he created them from the beginning male and female? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and holds fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not men separate. The union of a man and a woman should be indissoluble. Jesus actualizes the original project of God. Some very clever scholars say that the Genesis did not speak of marriage. Jesus referred indeed the creation narrative to marriage because marriage is a legal recognition that society gives to the order of creation. The disciples understood perfectly what it was about, saying, you say that this is what it is like for a man and, for a, and his wife, then maybe it is better if people do not marry. Then Jesus replied, not everyone can agree with that idea, but God has helped some people to agree with it. This last remark of Jesus is very important. Marriage and family <clears throat> will always be lived in more, more or less coherence with the fullness of sense and beauty preached by Jesus. What the, but the call for that fullness remains. Jesus did not at all idealize family life. Christ, Christ and Christian tradition with him do not establish a new structure of marriage based on faith. They re-establish in its fullness God's project on marriage and family. So marriage in the order of creation is a monogamic union of a male and a female person, open to parenthood and supposed not to be broken arbitrarily. 
This view of marriage is accessible to reason and human sound feeling. It may be recorded here, the study carried on by Professor Hans Küng, who died recently, through all world religions and philosophical system, Welt ethos. He singled out four ethical requirements common to most worldviews, namely, no murder, no theft, no lie, no adultery. Often it is said that the family of Nazareth, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, is an example for the family. Uh, in fact, it's not quite so, because Jesus was not very obedient when he was 12 years old. In his uh, talks, he often um, says he brings division in families. Uh, in order to become his dis dis disciple, you must leave your father, mother, children, and so on. Uh, you must not uh, bury your own dead. Uh, uh, he says, my mother, my father are those who listen to the word of God. He has no special devotion to his own family. His brothers, uh, uh, as Bible says, did not believe in him. And he said, call nobody father on this earth. There is only one father in the heaven. Search first for the kingdom of God. And so Jesus um, called our attention on our weak capacity to develop paternal and filial love. He gave us a higher model which helps avoid families to, or to become possessive, liberty killing and oppressive. The model of a family given to us is not so much the family of Nazareth, but the Holy Trinity. As uh, Amoris Laetitia states, God Trinity is a communion of love and the family its vivid reflection. From the Bible, we can enucleate the following structuring elements which belong to marriage and family. First, family is based on the union of a man and a woman Second, with a scope to generate and raise children. Third, in a reciprocal, faithful self-donation. If this is the hard core of God's project on human marriage and families, then it must be inscribed in the nature of human beings, not as an ideal, not as an empirical universal reality, but as a core for a fulfillment always ahead of us. God has created human beings free to answer to this call or not. What we observe is that families in the biblical and Christian sense are now dismantled on a large scale. And the very idea of a union of man and woman is challenged by same-sex marriages. Do these developments of the extreme individualistic anthropology meet the search for fullness and happiness is an open question. Certainly families are a, relation, a relational good, but friendships and social love, as Fratelli Tutti puts it, are also relation, relational goods. When we speak of the challenge of love, Nobody would contradict, but once you inquire what is meant by love, you have as many answers as available individual views on the market. <laughs> Human love may convert into its contrary if it is only emotional. The paradigm of love is the Holy Trinity. Married persons, who are open to the grace of Christ are certainly able to overcome the weaknesses and failures of human love. Human love, according to the New Testament and to Christ, means the uh, agape, which is the gift of oneself to the other. This is why the church understands natural marriage from the point of view of sacramental marriage. Sacramental marriage is a natural marriage between two baptized persons 
which reaches the fullness of meeting of natural marriage illuminated by grace. The project of God means a participation of human love in the creative love of God. Christian realism considers the call for a free adherence to God's project being perfectly aware of human weakness at the same time. The family as nurturing cell of society. Society owes its origin to the family made up of parents and children. Bonded by mutual love, the family teaches that every social link has an emotional dimension. The family should be a school of all of the virtues that strengthen society, mutual respect, dialogue, and so so solidarity. When the family is strong, society is better armed to resist the drift toward individualistic or collectivist excesses. When an individual-centered ethos demeans the family, the society itself suffers. In the industrialized and urban world, the crisis of the family is often accompanied by the crisis of, of, uh, of, the, of society itself. Some, some, because they are dominated by an extreme individualism, now consider that the family can no longer be the matrix of society because different kinds of so-called families claim the same right to social recognition. Society has no right to take over the responsibilities that belong to families. The family provides a home, a point of reference, an identity in time and space. It is the only institution founded on the freedom of a gift. The family cares for children until they become autonomous. The family is a place where values and traditions are transmitted. All human beings, for better or for worse, bear the trace of the first years of their childhood. They carry with them the influences and with the relationships developed with those who have been near and dear. Clearly, the family is a powerful creator of social links. The mission of the church is to convince. Amoris Laetitia is a vigorous call to personal commitment to marriage and family, and at the same time, a pastoral attention to those families which must overcome failures and desperation. Even when human law gives support to extreme individualistic claims, God's call remains, which helps finding back the proper vocation of human beings to engage in lasting love, making families a never-ended process of our humanization. I end with three questions. <clears throat> What can social sciences say about families, if not just describing the ongoing evolution that disintegrates the very nucleus of a natural family? Second, there is no question of fostering a single model of family, nor of idealizing families, but can social sciences enter into the sphere of intimate conduct of persons who all are characterized by their own experience of family life. And third, families are at the heart of the Western anthropological crisis. Can any kind of family be a, relation, a relational common good and a cell of society? I thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you very much. I said that uh, Marcelo Rosco asked me to excuse him because now he has to leave for a while, but he will come back in one hour time. Now, the discussion is open. Who wants to raise a question or consideration or contribution to the general discussion? Please. Yes. 
please, Marcelo. Uh, thank you very much, Excellency, for your excellent, excellent paper and uh, very interesting. Um, uh, I want uh, to know uh, your impression about about the, the last idea that you exposed, that is uh, the relation of the common good and uh, of the society and the family as cell of society. Uh, mm, because uh, I think that is exactly true. And in what sense the family can have an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an function about this? Yes, uh, well, the common good is what is necessary for all of us to be more human. Starting from uh, the, the first uh, uh, nucleus in which human beings live, and the first nucleus is the family. So if the family becomes a construct, an artificial construct, which is dis dismantled after a first deception, and, uh, and so on, <laughs> where is the common good that we uh, try to achieve? Uh, because um, we will come on the, on, the, on, the, on the marketplace, let us say, with an experience of, of a family which is very different of what would be a, a, const a, a family in a constructive way, in a, in a positive way. And uh, so the, the common good and, and the whole idea of society becomes different because since, uh, since antiquity, since Aristotle and all these people, um, the first uh, grouping which makes up the city, the civitas is, is the, the home, the home, uh, the, the city, the, the family around its gods and so on. But if there is no stable family and not a, a common concept of what is a family, uh, society will not be able to find where is its common good on a more global level. Thanks. Okay, yes. Please, very John. Much. John. A very, a very enjoyable paper, very informative and helpful. My question is this. In looking at the family, I see vulnerabilities, uh, the weakness of children being abused, the uh, irregular relationship between the parents where the vulnerable are exploited. And I wonder, is this the place where fraternity comes in as a common transaction for man to help the less well off, the poor, the ill-educated and so on? It seems to me that the family is a, is a methodology for us, as well as an entity, as a concept, to help our fellow man in obvious distress and obviously weakened by their economics and by the social impo impoverishment of many. That, that is, I think, very important to our concerns here, because I think it cements the notion beyond consumer and beyond individualism to, I would call it a duty of justice, for society to take responsibility for its members. You are Thank right. You. you are right. I perfectly agree. Um, I, I, as you noticed, I, I, I did not at all idealize the, the families because there are too many examples of failures. And uh, now we have under our eyes the extent of abuses um, uh, and, 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 and irregular families Yes, fraternity should help those who are wounded by this situation to, to overcome and to find back um, their humanity. But how can society help these people if it does not offer some model of what should be a family? Uh, that, that means uh, uh, of uh, mutual love and, uh, and uh, support uh, if, 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 if society comes with a, a, an individualistic view of society as a producer of, the, of goods and, 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 and not a, intrinsic links of persons responsible one for another, then I don't see how society can be better 
that destroyed families. Thanks. Uh, Marcelo, he wants to add some consideration to this point. Please, Marcelo. No, I want also, I was very interested in, in the question that put John. And I think that it's, it's, a, it's clear that in the history, in the family, we have these kind of things that you say. And, and, and just for this, in some sense, Christ make a restoration of the family with the sacrament, because the sacrament is just for this. In theory, in the practice, we need to live according with the sacrament. But the sacrament help to have a sort of sanatio, uh, sort of, uh, of purification mm -hmm. and purification of the, of the love and uh, generosity and real interest for the other and, uh, and also elevation. So uh, I think for this reason, just as you say, the family and the sacrament of the family help that the, the family can realize, actualize just the ends, natural ends of the family. That is very interesting. So my question is, this, uh, the family as cell need to have sort of, 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 of refusion of, of these goods to the older society. But really my question is, is enough this, or the church need to, so, to do something more? Thank you very much. Uh, that is a hundred million question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, no you, you are right. The, the sacrament shows what marriage is, what natural marriage is. And, uh, and it gives something more, which is the grace of Christ. And we all can touch the difficulty of human beings to reach the fullness of their potential without a help from outside. And it help comes from Christ. And this is all the, the, the mystery of salvation, the resurrection, all, all things we are celebrating in these days. And uh, this this fullness of, uh, <clears throat> of, of meaning, which is inside the, the marriage and, and family, can only be lived with, with, with the help of Christ. And so Christians, uh, Christian families should... Uh, and another point, uh, we, we remember, uh, the grace of Christ is not refused even to non-baptized people. Those who are really, who strive for being uh, full of love for, for their children, for their husbands, for their, and, uh, and do things as good, well as they can. Everything that helps us to overcome our selfishness is grace, is grace of Christ. And this is very important in our message, in our way to, 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 to speak, uh, to, to evangelize today. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Please, Anna. Ana Marta. Thank yes, thank you. I I like the I, I just have a comment. Um, I liked very much the approach that Monsignor Minerat has made to the issue of family because he has avoided the um, idealization of family life, which ironically is very uh, present in our culture, in spite of this. Um, irregularities and uh, yeah, injustices and everything. There is a funny idealization of family life, which is in contrast with the reality that um, on the other hand, we witness uh, in the media and, uh, and in, 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 in daily life. So I think that's a very good point. And at the same time, it, it helps to understand um, that family precisely because of this, precisely because the context is so complex, a family is a vocation. It's not just a matter of fact, something that happens, but it entails a, a real vocation to, to show how, you know, how real family life should be, no? in a way. No? I'm, not, I'm, I'm not idealizing family life, but just pointing out that um, by establishing this contrast, family life 
immediately, as, as the church understands it, immediately becomes a, um, yeah, a reference and a vocation to transform society. So I think that the approach is very helpful in this sense. Thank you. Thank you. Monsignor, yes. you are very, yes. I listen. Yes. Yes, you, can you react to? Ah, but, well, it was not a question. <laughs> so, no, so, but in fact, I said, would you react and not answer? That is why I said react. No, no, no. No, no. so you agree. Perfect, good. So, uh, other sorry. remarks? Or, yes, Vittorio. Vittorio uh, Hosle. Thank you, uh, Monsignore. Um, uh, it was a very rich and fascinating lecture. Also, the contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament views on marriage was elaborated very, very finely. My question is the following. The church, of course, has an ideal to uphold. On the other hand, the legal system of a society cannot help uh, ca cannot endure too much a distance from the social mores. This is a notorious problem, but I would like to hear your ideas about that. Um, mm. uh, for example, you mentioned, and I'm not sure I really understood you, um, uh, you seem to agree with the fact that children born out of wedlock should have less rights than uh, um, children mm. born in marriage. With the legal, you seem mm. to deplore the evolution of the legal system that treats children born out of wedlock equally with children born in marriage. Perhaps this was a misunderstanding. Yes, it was. <laughs> you are in agreement with the fact that yes. children born out of wedlock should, for example, in inheritance law, treat it as legitimate children. Uh, well, I, I think uh, children have no guilt at all at what happens to their parents. So if society recognizes the same rights, I think the social doctrine of the church would agree, does agree. There is no discrimination, uh, just, you cannot justify any discrimination on that level. I, I, I am sorry to have not been very clear on that issue. I, I did not say at all that if people from, okay. So now you, you raise a broad, very broad question about marriage as it is seen in the, in the vocation of the given by the biblical perspective and our legal systems. Of course, our legal system must uh, fit, fit with the social uh, development and mores, no? At the same time, um, they, they comfort these mores. They, they do not help them to, to, to be better. So what I say, I, I, I rely on the, this remark of Jesus who said, not everybody is able to understand what I said about marriage, about man and woman. And this means that it will always not be easy in society to, uh, um, to reach the level of, um, of um, <clears throat> structures, of the structure of marriage and family as in the word of God. The word of God is always ahead of what we can realize. So as long as legal systems, as laws, do not compel us to, for example, to divorce or to make things that we do not want morally, but we are free to behave according our conscience and above, and above our um, uh, belief in, in, in the in the call of Christ, in the call of God, and to, to live according to, to, to what the church is asking us to do. Uh, uh, but if, if these laws become compulsive, for instance, then no, you cannot, then you have the right of your consciousness has a right to resist, no? Uh, but it is true that in our society, the, the gap will always be, become bigger between the, the way of the values, let us say, which is uh, commonly accepted in society and the, the, the evangelical values. And, <laughs> and this is all the, the, the duty of the church to be able, first of all, to be aware of this and second, to, to live according to our own um, convictions, our own faith. 
and to be able to say to society, look, it, a, a different way can be possible. And we are happy in the way in which we are. Uh, this is uh, the very challenge of, uh, of the church today in society. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much, Monsignor. I think that unless there are any other uh, remarks or questions, we can move uh, to the presentation by Pier Paolo Donati. The title that he chose to is What to Expect from 2022 Plenary Session on the topic we are talking about today. Thank you. The floor is yours, Pier Paolo. Thank you. Well, in my speech, I wish to highlight uh, my own views uh, on the reasons for the title of the plenary, uh, The Family as a Relational Good, uh, which puts uh, the concept of relation at the core of uh, the issue of the family. Now, when I say relational good, of course, I mean a peculiar relational good. Uh, what we have to inquiry is the peculiarity of uh, this relational setting, which is le, the family, in respect uh, to any other relational context uh, or setting. So I think uh, that uh, all of you have received um, a short text of mine in which uh, I have summarized uh, uh, this presentation. And so I will be even shorter than, than that. Now, what I want to say is that we need uh, to translate uh, the social teaching of the church, which was explained in a wonderful way by Monsignor Minerat. Uh, we have to translate this message into the social sciences pers perspective. So not to have uh, uh, social sciences that destroy the family or uh, make uh, chaos about uh, family issues. Now, to be clear, um, I've given in the past a, a social science definition of, of, of the family uh, by defining the family as a, as a relationship of a full reciprocity between uh, genders, that is men and women, and between generations. Full uh, reciprocity means uh, that it covers all the dimensions of human life, because in the family, uh, we are obliged to, to respond uh, to any question because uh, any character dimension or aspect of our life uh, can uh, uh, be uh, ignored in the family, in the daily life uh, between the people. So I speak also of a social genome of the family. The family has its own uh, social genome, uh, which is a very complex uh, structure uh, made up uh, by uh, four main elements. Uh, gift, uh, free giving first, free giving between, uh, of course, the spouses and between the generations. Uh, reciprocity as uh, the rule of uh, daily life uh, sexuality in the couple and generativity. Uh, now, I cannot explain uh, this uh, <clears throat> social genome idea, uh, but what I want to say is precisely that we, we should uh, uh, put attention on how to translate uh, the social teaching of the, of the church, uh, which is in moral and theological into a, a more practical uh, uh, social perspective. Now, if we consider the deep and rapid changes of the family today all over the world, uh, due to the processes of modernization and globalization, it seems uh, necessary to ask ourselves uh, some basic questions uh, that push us to rethink the fundamentals of the family and its reasons for existence. Uh, in present society and then in the near future. And the question is uh, why the family and what for? We have to go to the basics of the family. 
What are the roots of the family as a natural society and to what extent can culture change them? What reasons support the necessity and the goodness of the family beyond the changes in its social functions? To my mind, the plenary intends to answer these questions. It is intended to assess the phenomenology of the family in the contemporary world from the point of view of the human and social sciences and social policies in order to offer the Catholic social teaching deep elements of knowledge about the current situation and as far as possible for the near future. By referring to the analysis of social facts, uh, the conference will reflect on the family on the horizon of its ontological being and in the perspective of exercising its primary tasks. It is a question of understanding how the family can today humanize the person in a society that is not always friendly with the family. The purpose of the plenary, to my mind, is not uh, to, to draw up a general descriptive report. There are plenty of statistics, uh, plenty of national and international uh, reports, uh, but we need to focus on the lines of thought and action that can best support the family in the world of tomorrow. In order to survive, our society needs family-friendly policies. What it means, family-friendly policies? It is still a question of implementing Article 16 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as Joe Stiglitz reminded us. To implement, to implement these human rights, it seems appropriate to deepen the meaning of family relations today taking into account uh, the fact that they are necessary for the humanization of people, but also strongly contingent uh, on the life course of people. The target is to make the family flourish as the primary relational good of society. To say that the family is a relational good means to affirm uh, that the destiny and happiness of people depend on the fact that they consider and share family relationships as their fundamental common good. This common good is created by family members, but it is not particularistic and does not remain closed in the private sphere because it powers its benefits on the community around with positive externalities that constitute the social capital and the human capital of large social networks. Modern social sciences have shown that family changes decide the most profound and significant changes in society and of society. Every new society is the fruit of new family models. Now in the apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis proposes a realistic approach to the theme of the family. He invites us to see the family not as an abstract ideal, but as a craft task, which must, must be approached with a tenderness. I cannot go into the, the quotation, it's a long quotation uh, by the Pope, but what I want to stress is uh, appeal to be realistic, to look at reality. Now, the conference is intended to deepen the concept of family as a relational good. What is the significance in saying that the family is a common good? The point is that as soon as we, one asks uh, which is uh, the significance of the equation family equals common good, the interpretations uh, wander radically. In national and international surveys, the prevailing answer is that the family is a common good in as much as it is at the top of the values shared uh, as a setting 
of affection, love, solidarity between intimates. In this sense, the family is a common good simply because the majority of the population shares the attachment to something which is felt as a primary support in everyday life, as a, sort, as a source of deep feelings, as a private space, whatever it's for. Only a minority sees and sustains the social function I would say the societal functions of the family, those that the family performs uh, for society. I should like to say clearly that the family is a common good in a very different sense uh, in regard uh, to the stereotypes uh, that circulate in the mass media. The common good is not a good of an aggregative type, uh, which uh, as a general concept, uh, consists in the sum of the well-being of the individuals belonging to a group or collectivity. But it is instead a good of relational type, which consists in sharing the relationships from which derive both individual and community goods and social virtues, social virtues like trust, reciprocity, uh, collaboration, and so on, and so on. It is, therefore, it is necessary to distinguish between aggregative and generative couples. What does it mean to read the family in a relational mode, that is, relationally? The core of my argument is that it is necessary to think relationally about the family. Since uh, human social reality and the family in the first place is made up of relations, only with relational thinking one can see something which otherwise remains hidden, latent, unsaid, and lacking reflexivity. I am referring to those relational goods on which the human quality and spirituality of life of every individual depends. It is uh, the relationship uh, that guides uh, the perceptions and gives a form to our feelings, which of course are elaborated inside, inside ourselves. A mother with a child, a father with a son, a couple of lovers or a family group find their identity in the relation of reciprocal belonging. The feelings uh, come from that relationship. If there was a different relationship, the feelings would be different. It would also be different the identity which we attribute to ourselves and to others. Emotions and feelings lead people to take a positive identity if they generate a mature relationship. That is, if they feed the, the relational skills of their identities. <clears throat> The problem of the relation is that they are invisible, they are immaterial, they are intangible goods. In order to be able to understand what this means, uh, we can compare the reality of social relations with the air. Even air is invisible, it is intangible. However, we cannot live without air. The relationships are the same thing. We cannot live without the relationships. Without social relations, we die as human beings. But the fact is that we can perceive uh, their existence only when they are negative, when they cause us problems or are absent while we need them. In the case of air, this is very clear. If the air is very polluted or too hot, or too cold, then we perceive it exists because it creates problems. The same happens in the family. It is when the bad relationships appear that we perceive the existence of an intangible and vexatious reality that eludes us. The relationships are part of our existence, not only corporeal, but also, and above all, 
psychological, cultural, and spiritual. When they become an irritating problem, then we are forced to reflect on uh, them as what to do, and uh, we must find an order from noise. The difference between the area and the social relationship is very instructive. The area is a mixture of various gases, which doesn't have an appropriate molecule. Social relations are different because when stabilized, uh, as in a stable family, they have a specific uh, social molecule. To say that stable social relations have their own proper social molecule, uh, why the air doesn't means that uh, first uh, they exist as external reality with regard to the terms of the relationships. That is, they are an emerging phenomenon. Emerging and existence uh, come from uh, the Latin existere, which means uh, stay outside with its own consistency whereas the air is only a mix of elements. It has, there is an aggregative uh, phenomenon. Second, this, em <coughs> sorry. this emergent structure has sui generis properties. I mean, the, the emergent structure of the family has uh, sui generis properties, qualities and causal powers, which are not the sum of those pertaining to, to its uh, composition, like in the formation of, of the water from hydrogen and oxygen. The family has its own molecular structure in so far as it emerges from the combination of the spouse relationship and the generative relation with their agents and their own emergent effect, which means that from these relations a reality of different order comes into being that is called family. By analogy with the biological genome, I call it the social genome of the family. It is on the backdrop of this structure, which of course is highly dynamic, that the family can generate the relational goods or in case it fails, the relational evils for itself and uh, for the surrounding community. The word regarding relation is a word in which we live uh, like the air, but of which in ordinary life, one is little or not aware of this because one gives uh, for granted uh, the air it itself. And uh, we give for, for granted uh, family relations as well. The activities of uh, counseling and various uh, therapeutic practices are ways that try to bring to the surface these relationships, rendering them more conscious and reflexive. In order to understand the relational dynamics in a family, practitioners need to organize their observations with uh, certain modalities, that is, they have to ponder relations by relying upon the nth order of observations and <clears throat> relational feedbacks. Automatic feedbacks can be useful in terms of producing practical therapeutic effects, as when the practitioner adopts uh, the technique of enjoining a paradoxical prescriptive norm according to the model developed by the so-called uh, Milano School. But in this case, the social relations are not properly seen and accounted for. They are only performed. They are used without achieving a deep understanding of their meaning. If people, if people want to have families who are aware of what is happening within them, they have to activate a specific uh, relationality, able to be reflexive about uh, their own relations, which means to foster a relational reflexivity in the interactions between the family members. 
Now, in pre-modern societies, and yet again in early modernity, the world of social relationships uh, was given for granted. And it is like that also today in many countries, in particularly in developing countries. Society had its direction sufficiently stable, reproductive, based on mores and customs in a majority of religious origin. It was a society guided by habit, by ab habitus. The society in which uh, we live today and the in the future is in instead increasingly morphogenetic, which means that it is continuously generating new social forms. We are living in the social morphogenesis. If we want to orient ourselves in the world, we must necessarily render the relationships uh, more explicit and reflexive. We cannot give them for granted. The family must respond to the reflexive imperative, which means that it must become a reflexive family. A family is reflexive not only because its members are individually reflexive, in so far as they have adequate inner conversation, but because they reflect together on the common relationship that binds them as a community. This is relational reflexivity, different from individual reflexivity. Family relationships change constantly. And because of this, our comprehension needs to be made more relational. There aren't any more fixed models and the consequent deviancies. We have uh, to deal uh, with the processes of relational morphogenesis. That is why I do not share the Chicago view, of course, as George Stiglitz said, uh, uh, of an individualistic kind, but neither would uh, join uh, the holistic perspective. Uh, the relational perspective goes beyond uh, uh, individual met methodology and uh, holistic uh, methodology. <clears throat> now I come to the conclusion. Inasmuch as the relationships nowadays are becoming morphogenetic, uh, we have to arm ourselves uh, with a new relational paradigm of the human person, of the family and of the whole society. This need regards uh, all of the human and social sciences. But one must be careful. There exists many and different so-called uh, relational paradigms. The fundamental distinction passes between uh, realistic paradigms, as I suggest, uh, and constructivist uh, realist, uh, relational paradigms. Now, in the social sciences uh, at the moment, there is a struggle between uh, what I call uh, uh, relationalism, relationalism or relationism and uh, appropriately relational, that is realistic, uh, critical realist uh, relational view of, uh, of the family. In the end, uh, the mystery of marriage and the family lies in the meaning of their complex uh, relationality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pier Paolo. Now the floor is open for questions, considerations, and uh, who wants to? Let me say that the analogy that you, Pier Paolo, uh, drew between uh, the family and hair is instructive because you said that. Uh, uh, until uh, now, everybody gives for granted the air itself. Now, nowadays, that is no longer true, because, uh, as we know, one of the major problems is uh, the, pro the same occurs with the family. For uh, such a long time, we took for granted the family as it uh, 
short of uh, inborn reality. And not paying attention, in particular, at the policy level, now we observe the reality that you correctly described. So I think that it's a good analogy which uh, uh, fits the point. The other argument, a question, when you say about constructivistic uh, paradigm, are you referring to rational constructivism in a phonic sense or in another sense? That is a clarification. I would be grateful if you could answer to it. Thank you, Pierre Paolo. Stefano, well, uh, I do not go back to your comment on air. Uh, we can go much further uh, on, the, on that uh, comparison between uh, what happened to the family and uh, what happened to air. I mean, if we talk about uh, uh, sustainability and a new uh, horizon of uh, 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 ecological and green policies, uh, uh, if we apply them to the family, there should be <clears throat> a lot of uh, things to be, to be uh, said and, and done. Uh, what I want to clarify is the term uh, relationalism uh, or relationism. Uh, no, it's not from, uh, from my, what I am referring to is to a, a, an increasing literature in the social sciences uh, drawing upon uh, uh, American pragmatism. That is John Dewey, uh, mainly Rorty, and uh, others uh, who understand uh, relationality in uh, in a very processual way. It's a relation as a process, as a fluid. It has no structure. It has no target, no goal, no uh, finalism in itself. Uh, so it's a, it's a, another way of uh, thinking. Uh, uh, of a, a liquid society. I mean, a relation as something that you can adjust in uh, whatever way you like. So relationalism uh, means to, to, to view the family uh, as something which happens, uh, an event, uh, something processual, transactional, and so on uh, in a pragmatistic way. Th that's the meaning of uh, uh, Thank you. relationalism to me. Marcelo. You want to raise? Please. I want to come back to this question of relation. As you know, relation is a category invented by Aristotle in substance, oh. and uh, and uh, is a, a formal category. So, relation is only. Uh, a category to put two things in 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 relation. So, uh, what is the content of this relation? Because in the contrary, uh, we remain in in, in a, a poor formality of relation of relation of relation. So, uh, we need to understand what is the specific relation in the family. So, this is the question for me not only to say relation and not only to say it's morphological relation with other, but what is just the specific? Because in the contrary, all things are relation in the end, in the society. So this is my question. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marcelo. Uh, I've written a lot. There are a lot of books on this, uh, on this issue. Now, Aristotle defines relation as pros t, which means proximity. It's a spatial notion, a notion about the space. Something is closed uh, to something else, or there is a certain distance. Now, um, Thomas Aquinas has a very different idea because the concept of relation in Thomas Aquinas is taken from the Trinity, from the relational essence of God. Uh, and so there is a discontinuity, uh, <clears throat> a big, deep discontinuity in the concept of relation between Aristotle and uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas. And from Thomas Aquinas on, uh, things uh, went uh, very fast uh, in changing the concept of uh, relation. 
Today, by relation, we mean a reaction, a, a relation in the sense of a reciprocal action. And it's an emergent effect uh, from uh, two sides of the coin interacting with each other. Now, from the interaction uh, comes out an emergent effect, which is the structure of the relation. It's a very complex matter. But uh, any this is a Kantian category. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Oh, yes, yes. This is critical that... realism. No, this is critical realism. The, no, no. But the... in addition, let me say that the relational good uh, is a concept by Aristotle. Aristotle yeah, talked about the relational goods. Okay? Yeah. This is the book by Martha Nussbaum on the fragility of the good, which is the fragility of the family. Hmm? Now, there is a, a long discourse on, this, on these issues. There is a, a, an entire library of books uh, on, uh, on this issue. But what I want to say is that we have to, to understand the, the category of uh, social relationship um, in very specific way. I mean, every social relationship has its own nature, qualities, and uh, causal properties. A friendship, uh, a friendship relationship is not a family relationship. The relationship between the doctor and the patient, uh, the relationship between uh, the teacher and the pupil, all these are relations, but they are different in nature in qualities and in properties. So what I am saying is that we have to discover and to be reflective precisely on the qualities, the specific qualities of the family relations, the spousal relationship, the conjugal relationship, and the generational relationship between parents and children. So these, also the relationship between the spouses and between parents and children are different. They have different qualities, okay? They, we, we call them relationship, but they are of a different nature. And when we provide services to the family, uh, particularly fragile families, families in need, etc., we have to study their particular, peculiar, forms of uh, relationality. And, the, the, and, and it is exactly the peculiarity of each uh, relational uh, complex, uh, the relational setting of a family, which explains the problems of the family. So, so also uh, the sacrament, also the intervention of the, of the church should be addressed uh, to make uh, uh, these relationships uh, according to their own nature. I mean, the friendship relationship is not the family, so, uh, and vice versa. So if we, if we intervene into a family relationship, we have to intervene not in the same way as uh, when uh, we are talking about uh, the relationship between a doctor and patient or, or between two friends. Friendship is one thing, the family is another thing. Thank you. Any other considerations, questions, remarks? May I, put, may, may I make course. a question? Please, mm. Vincenzo. So my, okay. My name is Vincenzo Bassi. I'm president of Federation of Ca Family Catholic Association in, in, uh, in Rome. I want to, to make a question to Professor Donati concerning the fact that uh, do you agree that these relations can be transformed in a function of public relevance? I want to, I want to explain this, uh, this question. What I can see in my experience is that the family has also a, 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 a carries out also a, a function of public relevance. It means that what they do inside the family as a public relevance. That's why we are so much interested uh, of uh, family and of the family issues. Uh, this is one issue. And the second one, uh, if we speak about community, 
Um, in my experience, I, I say also after this pandemic time that uh, the family associations, uh, which, uh, which are uh, made up by uh, different families, uh, they have relations uh, uh, among themselves. And these relations uh, are quite relevant also for the, the well being. And I think that this is the first community. So the community is the family, as we said, in the, also in the previous uh, um, speech. But the second community, the larger one, is the, the group of family. And in this group of family, we can create other relations which have also a public relevance. I mean, they serve, these relations can serve also the common good. I don't know if you, uh, whether you agree on uh, on this uh, uh, on this uh, this idea, this reality. Thank you, Professor Bassi, very much indeed uh, for for your question. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you are right. I mean, family relations uh, are not strictly private uh, nor public. They have a public relevance, uh, uh, which is a different thing, because. Uh, we think uh, that uh, family relations are merit goods, for instance, goods uh, that deserve uh, attention and support uh, by the state, by public authorities. And certainly it's not a private good in the sense that you can choose uh, whatever kind of family you want. So the, the drama, I think, about the family what we have to understand in our conference is that uh, uh, modern uh, society has divided the uh, society and all relations uh, into do two different domains, two different realms, the private and the public. We have a private law, a public law, private uh, corporations uh, and the state. And we do not have a uh, what is uh, mostly close to the family essence, uh, that is the community. The family is a communitarian entity, a communal entity, whatever we want to, to say about that. Uh, so uh, this is a real revolution that we need. A revolution in the sense uh, of going beyond modernity and restoring, besides, besides the private and the public spheres, what we call the community, the communitarian uh, setting in which the family uh, lives. Uh, and the family associations are very important to me. They are strategic for the future in the sense that they, they are uh, precisely the defense and the protection and the development of this communitarian sphere, which is not strictly private and not strictly public. They, in this communitarian area in which the family finds itself, is not a, a bridge between the public and and the private. It's not a mixture of public and private. It's another order. Of, of reality. I, I speak of the relational order of reality as a different uh, reality in respect to the private and to the public, to the individual, the market, uh, and the holistic, the state, uh, and so on and so forth. There, there is an entire <laughs> literature on that. So I Thank think you. that we have to, to assess exactly what it means, for instance, to have a communitarian law about the family, not a private or a public law about the family. Um, I talk uh, since many years of uh, the relational rights. The rights of the family are not individualistic, not neither individualistic nor holistic. They are uh, relational. They are rights uh, to have a good uh, marriage relationship, a good generate, generational uh, relation and so on. Now, the good is in the relation. That, that's what we need to, to think. Thank you. Thank you, Per Paolo. I think that uh, we reached the 
the time for listening to Ana Marta Gonzalez, Philosopher's Insights on the Family in the Light of Contemporary Challenges. Please, Ana Marta, the floor you. is yours. Thank you. Um, I will try to share a presentation because I think it will be easier for you to follow my words. And okay, it will be very simple, uh, uh, but well. So um, the, basic, the basic idea uh, I want to explore in, in this presentation is twofold. On the one hand, no family is a self-sufficient society. Families depend on society at large, as we have just heard. Yet on the other, society relies on families insofar as they nourish basic pro-social attitudes that strengthen uh, the social fabric and solidarity among genders and generations. So here, after reflecting on the distinctive features of family relationships, I will rely on philosophical sources uh, classical and modern, to highlight the relationship between family and society. While noting their common points, I will suggest uh, how their underlying metaphysics can enhance or curtail the humanizing power of the family insofar as it enhances or curtails uh, the conception that families have of themselves, what Professor Donati has called reflexivity, relational reflexivity. Well, a family is more than a group of individuals, each, of per each person their own individual interests. It is certainly more than emotional compensation for the hardships of modern life, as 19th century industrial society began to see it. Families constitute original social subjects with a specific structure and a specific social contribution to make that cannot be sufficiently appreciated from a merely functional point of view. They represent the initial institutional expression of human relationality, where such relationality is first experienced as stable and natural. And this is precisely the source of family's most original contribution to social life. It is within a family where human beings first learn what it means to be in relation with others, the meaning of sharing and reciprocity. Well, one might object that describing family by way of sharing and reciprocal caring is also true of many friendly relationships, since friends have also care for each other and share their lives in many respects. This is no accident um, because members, family members, ideally develop friendly relationships. However, family mm -hmm. relationships are structured around generation in the sense of procreation in a way that friendly relationships are not. Approaching family life through the lens of generation does not merely allow us to clarify the distinctive feature features uh, of family relationships when compared with other types of friendly relationships. It also allows us to explain why we can still speak of family bonds in absence of friendly relationships, as regrettably is sometimes the case, no? instead of common goods, common bads. No? Yet in order to understand the characteristic dynamism of family life and the deficiencies involved in non-ideal cases, we should consider family life in the light of the free re reciprocity characteristic of friendship. In Nicomachean ethics, Aristotle views family relationships as intrinsically uh, emerging from a particular kind of friendly relationship for which sexual difference is a requisite. In my view, the fact that Aristotle frames the issue of begetting children within his book of friendship is not insignificant. Human procreation is not just a natural fact, but has an intrinsically ethical dimension to it. While animal communities extend until reproduction is accomplished, human beings live together not only for reproductive purposes, but also to supply what they need for life. At the same time, Aristotle stresses that every child creates a new bond between the couple. This is so because a child brings a number of ethical requirements that in principle can only be met under certain conditions that reinforce common life. Kant's approach to the matter supplements the Aristotelian perspective with the idea that the child is endowed with personal dignity 
and entitled to treatment as an end in herself, and not just as a means for someone else's ends. Accordingly, the child becomes the source of obligation, obligations for her parents and relatives. Her natural need for care, nurturing, and education is not merely an empirical fact, but also an indicator of personal needs that naturally appeal to the people surrounding her calling for an adequate response. So here you have Kant's words about it. Children as persons have by their procreation an original innate not acquired right to the care of their parents until they are able to look after themselves. And they have this right directly by law, lege. That is without any special act being required to establish, to establish this right. From a practical point of view, it is quite correct and even necessary idea, a necessary idea to regard the act of procreation as one by which we have brought a person into the world without his consent and on our own initiative, for which we need, for which need the parents incur an obligation to make the child content with his condition so far as they can. They cannot destroy their child as if it were something they had made since a being endowed with freedom cannot be a product of this kind, or as if he were their property, nor can they even just abandon him to chance, since they have brought not merely a worldly being, but a citizen of the world, into a condition which cannot now be indifferent to them, even just according to concepts of rights, of right. In other words, in begetting a child, a couple simultaneously engenders a number of shared obligations, and responsibilities that can't detail details in the same place. Yet to the extent that the child is seen as the fruit of reciprocal donation, as is herself an object of love, those obligations and responsibilities will not be primarily seen as burdens, but rather as natural expressions of love. This love makes the moral obligations implicit in caring for other human beings not only lighter, but unbearable, but also even joyful. From an impartial perspective beholden to a restricted account of reason, love can be regarded as nonsense. As Aristotle points out, love is like an excess, which is why it arises naturally toward an individual. It drives the lover beyond himself. This explains why Plato characterizes it in Phaedrus as one of the four forms of theia mania, divine madness. Interestingly, Socrates deems this madness preferable to a reasonable, pragmatic approach of which the sophist Lysias argued in favor, because the latter simply expels any enthusiasm from the soul. In recognizing the divine nature of love, Socrates acknowledges that no one can adequately explain its origin, even if we all admire its effects. Perhaps the excessive nature of love its disturbing effects upon our nature corresponds to the, to the reality of our human condition, which on the one hand is marked by the infinitude of reason, but on the other is confined in space and time. Two important consequences follow from this. On the one hand, as people writes, the passions of the soul cannot be silenced without risking our humanity without reducing it either to dry rationality or to the brutality of instinct. On the other, our very finitude requires a structuring our responsibilities uh, through justice. In this sense, the need for justice is a consequence of our limited nature confined in space, in space and time, and thus unable to factually provide the kind of infinite response to each and every human being that, according to Levinas, we all in principle deserve. We get a first glimpse of how these ideas can naturally work together when we look at the family. The moral dynamics of family are grounded in the excessive nature of love, which conceals the obligations of justice implicit in the procreation of every human being, obligations between the couple and toward the child. So Aristotle can write uh, how a man should live in, in relation to his wife, and in general, how one friend should live in relation to another appears to be the same question as how they can live justly. Justice is a, a virtue as dynamic as the community it constitutes and structures. Yet as Plato suggests, the proper source of that dynamism is not to be found in justice, 
but in love. As a creative force, love carries in itself a desire for fecundity that transcends its own subjects, bringing them beyond themselves. We can say that rules of justice cannot explain the dynamics of love, yet they can protect love against its own frailties. In Barbara Herrmann's words, they construct moral regard. They remind us of the personal nature and dignity of those who we love. In Aristotelian terms, they remind us of the insufficiency of utility and pleasure as the foundation of this particular kind of friendship. In this regard, the fact that from a sociological point of view, marriage is increasingly viewed less as the foundational act of common family life and more as the consecration of a, of a commitment already lived raises questions as to the psychological path leading up to marriage in contemporary times. At any rate, it does not seem to have altered the fact that most people still view marriage as providing the most adequate context for raising a child, simply because marriage is meant to secure a context of reciprocal donation, which is deemed necessary for human education. Reciprocal donation thus provides the basic dynamism found in the family's different relationships. Interestingly, these originally provide a model for political relationships. Thus, Aristotle associates the paternal relationship with monarchy and the fraternal relationship with the republic and so on. At the same time, Aristotle distinguishes rather sharply between family life and political life. While the former revolves around necessary goods, the latter requires having basic needs satisfied. This is why family life represents a condition for political life. One cannot engage in free activities unless she has resolved her basic daily needs. The latter should not be interpreted merely as in materialistic terms. Although the economy represents an important dimension, essential dimension of family life, family is primarily made up of relationships that meet the human need for giving and receiving, in other words, the human needs for, for love. No? This latter consideration could explain why Aristotle thinks of family life as closer to natural needs than political life. Why he says that man is more a conjugal than a political being. Human beings are driven to constitute families earlier than to constitute political units. Families are natural primarily in this genetic sense. Compared with families, political units are natural mostly in a teleological sense, since the moral resources that originate in the family are further shaped in the political realm, which in turn provides the broader context for every human being to flourish in his or her humanity. This means that reason is bound to play a greater role in the constitution of political communities. Aquinas compares the inclination to political life with inclination to virtue. According to Aristotle, virtues arise in us neither by nature nor contrary to nature, but nature gives us the capacity to acquire them and completion comes through habituation. And according to Aquinas, just like, a, like virtues are acquired through human practice, cities are instituted through human industry. The kind of humana industria required to constitute political units explains why Aquinas' commentary to Aristotle, Aristotle's politics is articulated around the Aristotelian dictum, ars imitatur naturam. Yet, what is the object of imitation if not the kind of conviviality that we find in the family? And how far can we imitate that conviviality beyond the family context in absence of the natural dynamics that sustain family life? The answer we give to this question will depend on how we envisage human nature, on whether we think that nature and natural principle intimate a higher intelligibility, as Aquinas does, or rather we think of it as a mere contingent product of physical and psychic forces. In the first case, Nature does not merely provide a principle and even a model for art, but represents an invitation to transcend and seek insight into that higher principle, and perhaps to project a similar dynamism uh, beyond family borders. This, I contend, is the case 
when we recognize the transcendent or ecstatic nature of love and see ourselves simply as mediators between its original source and its ultimate end. Yet what happens when one thinks of love merely as a natural passion and nature as a casual equilibrium of forces? Also, the ancient idea of Ars Imitatur Naturam was still in force when David Hume developed his social theory. Its underlying understanding of nature had already been deprived of its metaphys metaphysical significance. Very much like Aristotle, Hume thinks that the precarious condition of human nature can be overcome only through the advantages derived from society, provided human beings are aware of them. He insists that such awareness is not the fruit of a study of, and reflection, but rather evolves quite naturally within the family. We could say with, with family practice. In a rather naturalistic approach, which at first skips the ethical context highlighted by Aristotle and Kant, Hume regards the family as directly supported by two direct passions. The natural appetite betwixt the sexes and concern for their common spring. Hume considers that concern for the common spring becomes also a principle of union betwixt, betwixt the parents and offspring and forms a more numerous society where the parents govern by the advantage of their superior strength and wisdom and at the same time are restrained in the exercise of their authority by that natural affection which they bear to their children." End quote. Well, this paragraph that I have quoted uh, illustrates the homeopathic principle which Christopher Berry coined in his characterization of Hume's social theory. It means that paternal authority and affection balance each other out so that parental rule does not degenerate into some sort of tyrannical rule. While Hume is far from thinking that the unsocial passions overpower the social ones, he is also of the opinion that the enduring ties generated in the family could make family members unfit for larger society, were it not for the rules of justice that restrict social equilibrium. Well, in his view, family life provides a natural example of the social equilibrium between unsocial and social passions that human beings would be moved to artificially reproduce in civil society. In addition, family life and specifically the taste for companion conversation acquired in the family provides the stimulus to venture out into society. Hume's account could provide a sketch of an empirical research uh, program on families' contributions to society. However, it may seem that in speaking of family life in terms of balance of passions, something important is lost from the original idea of love as an excess that inspires reciprocal donation and thus as the constitutive cement of social life or family life. Indeed, aligned with enlightened ideals of moderation, which distrust any enthusiasm or excess, human does not, Hume does not recognize in love a reliable ground for marriage and family life, only in so far as it is tamed by habit, it is only in so far as it becomes friendship, can love ground a steady relationship that in a way represents a prolongation of one's self. Yet while love certainly represents a victory over selfish individual impulses, it could also be the source of group selfishness. As a matter of fact, Hume is not only keenly aware of love's power to overcome selfish impulses within the family, but also recognizes how its natural dynamics aid in the development of that taste for company and conversation, conversation which in turn operates as an incentive to establish social relationships beyond family borders. Yet insofar as he does not see in love anything but a natural passion, he does not regard it as uh, enough to counteract that group selfishness. This is why he resorts to artifice. In order to both satisfy our social passions and the natural desire to acquire, which is one of the basic passions according to Hume, we cannot rely on nature and must instead introduce some conventions like fixation of property, rule for its transference, promises, and so on. Those conventions would help us redirect the basic desire to acquire so that we can all satisfy it in peace. Now, 
Hume is right in arguing that uh, the prosocial attitudes developed within the family stimulate reproduction of the same attitudes in general social interaction. He's also right when he stresses the need for artifice in social life. But his empiricism prevents him from connecting the former observation with other considerations that are equally important for calibrating the influence of human agency on the configuration of social attitudes and relationships. We should consider that human agency relies on beliefs about the principle and end of human action. Depending on how deep those beliefs are, human agency will be more or less likely to expand itself beyond the immediate interests of its circle. This means that, that from the perspective of human agency, metaphysical considerations are not without consequence. This is, it's one thing that to approach the donation and reciprocity experience in the family simply as a natural fact, as the fruit of passion, so to speak. Uh, and quite another to see the same natural dynamics as expressive of a higher principle, as Plato clearly suggests in Philos. In the latter case, the agent could eventually be moved to bring that experience in connection even with a religious conscience and find new reasons to project the same attitude beyond the family, or even to broaden the very notion of family beyond biological uh, bonds. I would quote St. Paul, I kneel before the father from whom every family in heaven on earth and on earth is named. Well, the believer who sees God as the father and origin of every family and as the ultimate uh, source of love, recognizes this love as a reason to love one another. Or St. John, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. The fact that such a language is possible shows that people do not experience love simply as a natural fact. Rather, they are moved to interpret the same natural dynamics of family love in very different ways. And those different interpretations may provide them with further motivational resources to expand the dynamics of love and reciprocity beyond their immediate circle of friends and interests, progressively widening the scope of that circle. Indeed, one distinctive mark of Christianity is that it entails a call to bring the transcendent dynamics of love beyond the, the seemingly reasonable limitations derived from psychological and sociological facts. The point I want to make is very simple. Human beings cannot live without interpretations because human experience is not made up of just brute natural facts. Rather, what we call natural facts represent an abstraction of meaningful behavior that is always imbued in culture. Indeed, as Heraclitus put it, natural like, nature likes to hide itself and it certainly hides behind culture. Culture, however, can foster a transcendent or a naturalistic, a naturalistic interpretation of human experience. In absence of a transcendent, meaningful interpretation of the dynamics related to familial love that strengthens and amplifies its natural dynamics, people become more vulnerable to dominant cultural forces. Anna and Marta, you have five minutes, okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm finishing. And the behavior can be more easily shaped by the formal and instrumental rationality that often rules and mark, uh, civil and market society. This can be observed in the incorporation of managerial language. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz mentioned that in his presentation. Uh, now it's very common. People introduce managerial language into family and couple interactions, as Eva Ilus has convincingly documented. From this perspective, it, it should be acknowledged that the humanizing power of family relationships can be enhanced or curtailed by the metaphysics underlying the conception of family. Indeed, human agency is marked by its enhancement via adequate reflexivity. Thus, just that human, as human beings need to be aware of who they are in order to act accordingly, families too need to become increasingly aware of their identity in order to develop their specific potential in society. In principle, families' specific contribution to the larger society is seen in their ability to stimulate and develop reciprocity-based relationships, not only within the family, but also in society at large. From this perspective, families can reasonably view themselves as a privileged source of humanization. 
Nevertheless, how families think of themselves and how to implement that self-conception in practice is crucial for assessing the quality and depth of their humanizing influence on society. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aramata. Now we have time for discussion and also for the general discussion before we close uh, at uh, six, uh, according to the program. Thank you again, Anna Marta. The floor is open, please. Pier Paolo. Uh, Anna Marta, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. I want uh, to ask you <clears throat> to expand uh, the concept of, of love and uh, you talked a lot about love, which is, of course, uh, uh, central and focal in, in, in family life. Now, there are very many different kinds of love. We love a person, uh, we love uh, a dog, our domestic dog, uh, or a cat, we, we love flowers, we love uh, mountains, uh, etc. Now, let me tell uh, an anecdote. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, in a lecture at the university, I spoke uh, about uh, the difference between uh, loving a human person and loving an animal, there was a student, uh, a girl, uh, who got up very angry and said, well, I love uh, my boyfriend uh, uh, not so much. I, love, I, I like and I love... Uh, my dog uh, much more than my boyfriend. She couldn't distinguish between uh, different kinds of love. And I think that young people today uh, are in difficulty with family life and family formation and uh, becoming, becoming acquainted uh, with, with what the family is because they do not distinguish between different forms of love. They do not understand uh, uh, human love uh, properly. So the question is, uh, how will you explain uh, that love in family relations uh, is different uh, in respect to love uh, for a cat, a dog, or even a friend uh, to, to these uh, new, new people? Thank you. Well, yes, that... this is a challenge. Nowadays, no, you, you have to start uh, explaining that love is not just a, an emotional reaction. Uh, it's not just affection, although it includes affection, of course, and it's primarily a passion, according to Aquinas too. But then you have to explain the difference between that affection and benevolence, which uh, even Aristotle, uh, in his book on friendship, um, he, he, he makes this distinction benevolence, uh, you want the good for that person. You want that this person, you know, prospers and be happy. And uh, so um, in, in, in love, there is this dimension of giving. This is why I think it's interesting, uh, the idea of, um, yeah, giving. Uh, there is an, an element of an active element and not, not just a passive element. But this, of course, is a very um, a deep question. And it also requires to explain that love for people, uh, you, you can have benevolence, but in order to have friendship, you, then you have to develop a reciprocal uh, benevolence uh, in absence of, uh, I can be very, very benevolent with my uh, basketball team, but you know they don't know anything about it. So there is no friendship. So. Um, friendship requires that kind of reciprocity. Uh, we must know about that reciprocity. Uh, reciprocity is a very important term in order to speak of human uh, love. No? Uh, and beyond that, um, love, according to, to, to Aristotle also, uh, requires, brings this element of excess. Uh, as a matter of fact, he he blurs the difference uh, a little bit between friendship and love, only to say that when uh, love is excessive, then it somehow becomes a, a, a different thing or 
from a even from a qualitative point of view. So, but the the, the differential point would be in benevolence, which entails uh, to wish the good for another. No? Uh, if you bring this to Aquinas, then he has this distinction between love of, of concupiscence and love of friendship. But the the whole point of this distinction is um, the example he uses is when I drink wine, I love the wine with love of concupiscence, but I love myself with love of friendship because I love the wine as a means for me, but I love me myself uh, as an end in itself. So this is the, it's very tricky, the analysis of love from a conceptual point of view, but the, from a practical perspective, the idea is that you want the good for, uh, for the other person. No? Thank you. Marcelo. Thank you, Maria. Ana Marta. Uh, Ana Marta, thank you for your very interesting paper. I want to ask you, what is the new uh, in, your, in, your, in your light, in your perspective of the documents of the, of the synodal? Because uh, in, re in reality, this meeting has some relation with this, and, and we don't have nothing about the synod of the bishops in, in, in our paper. So what the, there are some news or not, <laughs> or are only repetition of the thing? No, well, I don't think it's, uh, it's only a repetition. I think it's um, a matter of uh, stressing, well, the realistic approach. Uh, I think, I don't know who was, who said something about realism in the approach to family life, but I agree with that. Uh, being closer to, to the social reality, uh, not, not remaining in the, um, let's say, in the normative level, but trying to incorporate the, the, the practical reality. This doesn't mean to, to put the normative level aside, uh, but it means to develop a prudential approach, a more, uh, a more sensitive approach to real family life. Uh, that, that's my view, but it's true. We, we, we haven't reflected that on, on our, on our uh, reflection right now. Yes, but we can do that for the, for the plenary session. Thank you. Thank you. Other interventions? Vittorio, please. Please, Vittorio. Uh, uh, Anna Marta, thank you so much for an extremely rich and uh, fascinating presentation. My question uh, relates to what you said at the end, which I found quite fascinating, namely that our metaphysical view of the world has an impact on our behavior. And indeed, that is, if you want, um, the wisdom of Catholicism, that Catholicism uh, offers a very profound combination of a complex metaphysical tradition with a moral philosophy clearly inspired by universalist ideas and at the same time avoiding the formalism that universalism has transformed to um, in uh, um, late modernity. Uh, that is the reason why I think we all are fascinated by this tradition. But what I would like to do if you are a philosopher, perhaps some other um, of our colleagues from the social sciences can help us. While I think that what you are saying is eminently plausible, is there any empirical uh, evidence that people who have a metaphysical basis for their moral commitment tend to be more reliable? I mean, interesting question, for example, which I would really like to have from social scientists. Do people who undergo the preparation for a Christian marriage divorce less frequently than people who don't? So is there an empirical connection between the metaphysical interpretation that we give to marriage and the stability of marriage? Or is it only as it ought to be, but without real empirical uh, connection? Do you know that? <laughs> this is not a question for me. <laughs> Pierpaolo knows. Pier Paolo knows. Yes. yes. Uh, mm, it, I wouldn't talk about metaphysics, but religion. There are very, very strong uh, 
uh, sociological researches showing that uh, religious families are much stable and uh, happier than uh, non-religious families. If you take religion as a metaphysical environment in a sense of thinking about uh, metaphysics, something which goes beyond <laughs> materiality, uh, now there is a, a big evidence, uh, yes, that uh, these families, religious families, produce much uh, um, relational goods, uh, much more relational goods than, than the others. So may, I, may I answer? Evidence. Yeah, there is. Yes, please. Please, Vincenzo. So, uh, well, uh, as to my point of view, uh, I, can, I can tell that uh, uh, the families uh, that are part uh, of a feminist group are much more stable than families that are alone. Because the individualism does not pertain just uh, the, uh, per, the, the human being, also the family. And especially, especially these, you can see these evidences, especially during this pandemic time. Because uh, more than uh, lack of job and lack of money, the loneliness is the worst, the worst uh, uh, sickness of, of the families. So that's why maybe this is my proposal. We can start, we can approach uh, the family, also speaking about communities of family, of families, because. Uh, I can guarantee you that uh, when you share the problems and it comes from reality, when you share the problems, you solve most of the problems because you can say that your problems are the same of the others. It's not this, it's, it's a simple way of resolving them, but it's the reality. And all the law, all the law comes from the reality because uh, do not forget that the law is a question of responsibility. And the family is a joyful responsibility. And the law comes from the responsibility. That's why it's very important to analyze, to assess, to, uh, to verify, uh, detect the phenomenon, the reality. Because uh, uh, now we are living a real change of paradigm, a real uh, change of epoch. And we, we have to start from that. And I think that we should be inspired by this pandemic time, looking at, at the families and the relations lived in the families. Now they have, a, a, we can have evidence everywhere. They have a, a public relevance. And I think that we have to start from that because when we talk about the, 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 the function of the family, the, uh, we can. Uh, we don't need to speak about the identity of the family, because the family has a, a, a function. They concur to the common good. It is. This is a question of reality. It's not a question of ideas. Thank you. Well, let me add uh, myself, if I'm allowed. <laughs> now, mm, to what just Vincenzo said, we should always consider that. Uh, Potestas, non veritas, facit legem. On the other hand, veritas, non potestas, facit use. So we have to distinguish between the law and the right. Not every law, just because they are laws passed by parliaments or whatever, they fix a, a rule which should be accepted. This is this debate, for instance, uh, in these days uh, in our country in the parliament, uh, there is a, a law which is under uh, generating a, a lot of uh, disputes exactly for that. Second remark is um, what uh, Anna Marta said before uh, is um, about reciprocity. The point is that we most of the time keep on confusing the reciprocity relation with the exchange of equivalence of relations. And that is, of course, is due to the fact that we live in market type societies where the exchange of relations in the market are dominant. 
And that is the reason. In fact, when <laughs> a few hours ago, Joe Stiglitz criticized uh, the Chicago School, because if you read the, the book by Gary Becker, which is a disaster, and you should know, and I know for certain, that a great number of Catholic universities in the courses of both economics and law, they base their courses on the book by Gary Becker and others. And because, uh, you see, uh, the market uh, mentality has entered everywhere. So the, the family is based on a contract. That is the basic tenet of that approach. The contract between a man or the woman, or as we some people say today, by two individuals, on the basis of which they regulate their common interest, etc. So that is why it is important to give a proper definition of reciprocity, because it's not enough to say reciprocity. I ask, tell me what is, what are the basic differences between an exchange of equivalence relations and a reciprocity relation. Try to put raise this question to a certain number of people. You'd get no answer at all, or just tautologies. They're saying, oh, reciprocity is reciprocity. Yeah, but that is a tautology. Because we need, if we want to tackle the issue of the family properly, to be clear. Of course, other people might have different ideas. OK. But we have, from the point of view of the synod, of Bishop Synod, uh, to, if we want uh, them and other institutions to take a position to define exactly what determines a reciprocity, really distinguish it both from exchange and from a command. Because we have a plenty of literature on command relationship, command in the, in the strict sense and on exchange, but not on reciprocity. That is perhaps uh, something that uh, we might tackle next year when in the plenary session, we dedicate a lot of attention exactly to this. But I think that there are other people who want to add and say something. Any other consideration or? Yes, okay. Please. Coming back to the question of uh, <clears throat> the different senses of the word love. Love. Uh, we are very much uh, uh, limited by the language we use. Yes. Uh, for yes. instance, in English, you have a distinction of to love and to like. In French, you have not even that distinction. In Hebrew, there are so several words, but important to note three Greek words, which are quoted in uh, Benedict, uh, Benedict's encyclical, eros. which is eros, philia, agape. and agape. Eros, well, I'm not going to make definitions, everybody knows, uh, but it is basically a different sense of, of love, and each one is authentically human. <clears throat> Uh, agape is naturally, it's ob obviously a word which has been coined by the Christians. It has no meaning before the New Testament. And it is a new dimension of love, which also should exist in marriage and families, which is love for the sake of the other. Uh, a self-giving uh, love, giving up one's life for the other. This is not we are very far from the market very far from the school, uh, chicago school and this has to be uh, clarified because <clears throat> agape belongs to the human experience at least as much as uh, making a contract uh, <laughs> between between married people about how they are going to uh, to carry on their host household yes Thank you. Sorry, to disrespect, I would just like to say one word. The marriage is the only negotium, it's not a contract, but is a negotium, which has been stipulated for the interest of the other, not for your interest, for the interest of the other. This is the, the biggest uh, difference. That's why, for example, according to Italian law, the matrimonio is not a contract. 
but is a negotium because genus contract is a species of the same genus, but is not a contract. That's why also the uh, pre-marriage agreement cannot be applied according to Italian law because they are not a contract in the sense of the mutual interest, it's not the mutual interest, it's the interest of the other. And I think that we have to stress this kind of difference because it's a real difference. Yes, but you again, according to canon law, um, <clears throat> which relies on, on Roman law, uh, marriage is a contract yes. of, will, of two wills who want to say, to decide to, to live together. And uh, uh, but, but this is a contract uh, which does not depend on the two contractors. It is a pre-set contract, marriage, in which you enter and uh, <clears throat> which has been given by the creator, as a matter of fact. But what you said, Monsignore, is very relevant because the three levels of love namely eros, philia, e agape, that is um, keep on making confusion. We have to come back and distinguish that. Agape is typical of Christian. Mm -hmm. That is uh, because it presupposes the notion of gift as gratuitousness. Gratuitousness, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Other considerations or remarks? Please. Uh, I want to say something that really I find new in the Synod, and it's in relation to the grace of Christ, because mm -hmm. uh, it's clear uh, in the Synod, there are some texts, but there are that, for mm -hmm. example, say in the line of, as I say, of Thomas Aquinas, that this in, in the marriage, the, we have this idea of the ministers give the grace one another. Uh, in, some, in some sense, I say Vincenzo, but this is a su, su natural communication of grace. Uh, and this, of course, is in the love, but it's a love, not only an, a love to communicate love, or good, but communicate love and good as participation of the divine love. Uh, mm -hmm. We can say an, 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 a love that come directly for the Holy Spirit, that is the love in the Trinity. So it's a real change. Uh, and I think this consideration is very important because in the contrary, we only speak about the natural uh, marriage and this is one thing, but <laughs> in, in, the, in the idea of Christ and in the idea of the church, uh, this is a sacrament. That is a different thing. Of course, it's founded in the natural institution, but it's another thing. And, uh, and say, the common life of husband and wife, the entire network of relation of grace that they build, with the children and the wall around them will be steep and strained by the grace of the sacrament. So this is a new thing that we don't have in the precedent magisterium. So for me, this is one of the more important affirmation of the synod, and we need to reflect about this. Thank you. Yes, that, that is that's very important. Yes, thank you. Who, who else wants to contribute? Aude, you want to say something? I am um, sure. Yes, okay, please. Yes, yes you Thank lift you the hand. Much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we, are, we have noted the difficulty with the word love. Do you know, everybody here, if anyone has ever tried to invent a word in French, English, German, Italian? to translate the word, the Greek word agape. Mm. Uh, could we think about this, this uh, propose to, to invent a new word? Uh, I think it would take time 
but uh, can we think about that? Uh, does anybody uh, think, uh, did anybody think to, to this um, invention of a new world? Mm. Yes. Oh, Please. Oh, okay. it, will, it will probably be difficult or impossible to find a new world. Uh, but we, we just could say agape. <laughs> speaking French, English, or German, and use the word agape, the Greek word agape. Yes. Uh, and so we, we, we see that it is something specific. On the other hand, it's also interesting that, uh, in a way, the three dimensions are linked together. I think that's also interesting, because there is something common to all of them. Even if we can distinguish between eros, agape, and philia, uh, there is also room for, uh, well, th th there is some commonality. This is why we speak of love, no? Probably in some contexts we need to, to, to make a clear distinction in order to, you know, clarify things, but other times it's good that they are fused together. I don't know if it, I don't know whether it is a good translation, but as to me, as a jurist, I used to, I like very much the Latin word munus, munus. And when I have to translate it in Italian and also in, in French, uh, because it's much more difficult in English and German, uh, I, I speak about dono, don. Uh, and uh, it works, it works, it works. Because munus is something that uh, is not a consideration is not a consideration. It's, some, it's also tax, also tax, because munus means for Cicero tax, uh, Cicero uh, used for the word tax munus, it's uh, the principle of everything. It's the principle of the everything. And in the, the meaning of munus, you can find also uh, love in the sense of agape. And the don, uh, dono in Italian, I think that uh, is a, not the best translation, but is a good translation, and the same is in French, as to me. Of course, it's not uh, what you want to say, because uh, you need the word to, to, to be used in educating uh, uh, people, uh, young, uh, young couples. I know what I mean, but if you use the word dono, it's not donation, because donation is when <laughs> you get poorer. You get poorer. I mean, as a lawyer, as, a, as a, I can say that the donation is something different because donation, you get poorer. With dono, no. Cum munitas, cum munus. It's something that I, I rest, I remain rich as well as I, before uh, the, the, do, the munus. So it's a, a good way to translate agape, as, as according to my opinion. Thank you. Uh, I can I say something? Yes, Marcelo. Uh, I think it's not only a question of the world, of the, uh, but it's a question of also of notion, concept. And, and we need to understand this question that I don't think that is clear in our, in our, in our meeting. Of course, uh, Monsignor Mineral speak well, but the, the sacrament is one thing different. It's love, but it's a love in the sacrament. And it's the agape, but it's agape in the sacrament. So it's a mediation of the grace of Christ. This is a new, and we can have love and not the grace of Christ, but we are children of God because we are in relation of the grace of Christ that have the great capital grace for all the church. And this is the essence of the church in the sacrament of the grace of Christ. This is the question. So this is an extension. Uh, I, I want to, to, to come back to this because for me, this was the more interesting thing in the Synod. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was just going to add uh, another thought that for me, um, the grace element is clearly important for the notions of community and justice because it seems to me that that is the, the, the construction we have to bring to how we think about the family in terms of the social order that it provides, as well as the duty and responsibility that we all have for it. And I think that the grace of the family 
ebbs out into society. But equally, from what uh, we've just heard uh, Marcello explain eloquently, the notion of grace of God, of, of the creator, is to provide for society a construct that gives us community responsibilities through a, it has to be through justice, it's got to be through justice, because that's what, what it's about. Uh, the, the, the truth of the justice is a connection that the values of our society have to be informed by. And I feel very strongly about that because I fear that the construction of a legal order alone without this grace and perception of community and justice is simply not to work because it could easily make illegal what our moral code te teaches us is right as a thing from wrong. And we can't rely on society to distinguish good and bad or right and wrong. We have got as an informed conscience to inform that, but sometimes we are not listened to. Therefore, I think that construction has to be taken forward in the way in which we see uh, the agape as a grace giving a function of belief in our society. That's just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yes. Any other remarks or considerations? Well, of course, we will continue tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m. and. Um, I'm sure that some of the questions that have been raised today will be retaken tomorrow because there are connections with the topics uh, that will be uh, that uh, people like Vittorio himself, uh, Gustavo Bellis, uh, and Rocco Buttiglione will tackle. <clears throat> so, unless there are any other uh, remarks or consideration, we we have been here attached to the <laughs> to this instrument for three hours and so we deserve a rest because we run the risk of becoming mad <laughs> unless we are already mad so thank you very thank you much, very much. To, thank you very much for each, all very each one papers. of you very and have discussion. a nice evening thank okay you, you can you. afford thank now drinking a good wine or a good <laughs> beer according to the tasters okay ciao bye-bye bye-bye thank you everyone thank you very much Thank you.